Welcome to Shepherd of the Plains Lutheran Church in Fort Morgan, Colorado. I'm Pastor Jacob Hanneman, and it is an honor and a privilege of sharing God's Word with you today. Once again, you can see that we are not at Shepherd of the Plains, but once again at my house due to the fact that we are renovating our worship area. If you would like to follow along and see how the progress is coming, is coming you can go to our website to look at all the pictures that are posted. Today is the, still the season of Lent, and we are still asking the question of why. Today, we are asking the question of why did God send His Son? Last week, we reviewed why we needed His Son to come, and that is because of our sinfulness. But then, why did God do it? God didn't have to send His Son. He didn't gain anything by sending His Son. So why did he send him? What, what made us so special that God wanted to sacrifice himself and suffer immense pain and torture so that we could be with him in heaven? Today, as we take a look at the book of Numbers, we will see our answer. You can follow along with the order of service as it is printed for you in our service folder. If you would like a copy of the service folder, you can find that also on our website. If you do not want to use the service folder, you can follow along on the screen. For those who do use our service folder, there are opportunities for singing hymns printed for you. If you so want to take that opportunity, just simply pause the video so you can sing your praises to God and then resume when you are ready. So now, let us enter into God's presence by bowing our heads in prayer. Lord God, you did not forget the pierced body of your Son, and his sign was not hidden from you. In your kindness, look also on us, your children, weighed down with sins, and grant us the fullness of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. We now begin with the opening words and confession. And so we begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now join together in confessing our sins to our God. Almighty God, merciful Father, I confess to you that I have not loved you with all my heart, and what I have done and left undone. I have pursued my ways instead of your ways. I have not loved my brothers and sisters as myself. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. I am truly sorry for my sins. I repent of them. I beg for your mercy, O Lord. The Almighty God has been merciful to us and has sent his Son to die for all. For his sake, God forgives our sins and calls us from darkness to his marvelous light. And so therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we confess that we deserve to be punished for our evil deeds, but we ask you graciously to cleanse us from all sin, and to comfort us with your salvation. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We now continue with the readings for today. The readings for today tell, remind us of why, again, it helps answer the question of why Jesus came in the first place. And that is because of God's grace, His mercy, and most importantly, as we will see in Numbers, is love. Our first reading comes to us from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 10. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God, ra and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace 
expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of the Lord. Our next lesson comes to us from John chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. At this time, if you have any children, this is a good time to sit them in front of the screen, for now is the time for the children's message. Hi, kids. Today we're going to look at in the sermon the lesson of the people of Israel in the desert when venomous snakes entered into their camp. What led up to that was that the people of Israel, they didn't appreciate what God was doing for them. They saw some of the things God did, but they thought God wasn't doing good enough, and that's because they just didn't realize how much God was protecting them. For 40 years, can you imagine? 40 years, that's a long time. God never allowed one poisonous snake to enter into their camp. Now, they lived in the desert. There's snakes all over the desert, and some of them are very dangerous. And yet, for 40 years, these people never had to deal with snakes, especially the poisonous kind. That was just one of many blessings God was giving to them, even though the people never really noticed. Sometimes we don't realize all the things our God does for us. I mean, we think about all the stuff that we love. We love our families. We love our friends. We love what we're good at. If we're good at something, we think about it all the time. We love the possessions, the toys, the cool things that we have right now that we cherish. Well, it's easy for us to realize that that's what God gives to us. But what about all the other things that God gives? What about the abilities? What about your other friends? What about other blessings that maybe you don't see all that highly, but yet you still need them? God gives us so much more, so much more than we could even begin to count. We don't even have enough time to announce all the blessings. In order to show the people of Israel how much he takes care of them, he took away that one blessing of protecting them from snakes. And when the people saw that it was God who had been protecting them, they realized that they shouldn't have complained. And so they repented. They said they were sorry, and God provided an answer to all the snakes. He had Moses make something kind of like this. Kind of a pole with a snake, but it was a bronze-colored snake that he posted up, and he told the people, if you look at this, you won't die from the poison of the snakes. Now let me ask you, did the people live because the pole and the snake was really powerful? The answer is no. It was just a bronze snake on a pole. Then why was it when they looked at the snake, were they healed? Who was the one healing them? Who were they really trusting in? They had to trust in God. 
It was God who promised them that if you look at this, you will be healed. And when the people believed that God was telling them the truth and they looked at that snake, they were. God also wants us to look at something so that we can be healed, but it's not an earthly healing. It's not from being sick. It's from our sins. It's from our mistakes. Do you know who God wants us to look at? He wants us to look at a cross and again, not because the cross by itself has power, but because of who went to that cross. Who, who went on a cross and died for our sins? It's Jesus, isn't it? Jesus died for our sins. And when we look at a cross and we, rem we remember that it was Jesus who went up there, why? So that we can go to heaven and we believe that? We'll be forgiven. We will be healed from an even greater sickness called sin. Sin is so much worse than the poison of snakes. All the snakes would have done was take those people's lives. But sin tries to take our eternal life. But because Jesus went to a cross and died for us, we're not going to suffer. We didn't lose our eternal life. Instead, now we can go to heaven. And whenever we look at a cross, whether it's at church or whether it's a piece of jewelry or whether it's in your home, we can be reminded that Jesus did that for us so that we can go to heaven. What a wonderful gift our God has given to us, that he has given us the symbol of a cross to remind us of our salvation. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, just like the bronze snake, the cross by itself has no power. But you are the one who gives it power, healing power. Because when the people put their trust in you and they looked at that snake, they were healed of the poison. And when we put our trust in you and look at a cross and know that we are saved from our sins, we will be. We will be forgiven. And it's all because of you, because you have the power to save. Thank you for using that power on us. Thank you for saving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, now we'll get ready to hear the sermon message. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our lesson for today comes to us from Numbers chapter 21. Verses 4 to 9. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people. And many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. This is the word of the Lord. When Paul wrote to the Romans, he said that everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. Paul was speaking about the Old Testament lessons that deal with the history of God's people Israel. Today we're looking at another incident in the lives of the people as they wandered in the desert. And so, taking from what Paul said, the purpose of these lessons is to teach us. is to give us a lesson, something to learn, not only about this world and about people, but more importantly, about our God. And we have a lot of questions about our God, and today we're looking at one very important question. And that question is, 
Why did God send his son? Last week we were reminded why we needed him, but why did he send him? What made us so special that he decided he was going to save you and me? We find our answer by looking at the people of Israel and seeing what made them so special that God decided to save them from some venomous snakes. To kind of recap what's been going on in the lives of the people, last time we saw the people of Israel, we saw them at Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments. Along with those commands, God then gave them a whole bunch of other commands. We call them the civil commands and the ceremonial commands, so commands to deal with their everyday lives, but also commands on how to worship and how to do sacrifices and when to meet and when to gather. The purpose of these extra commands was to set the people apart from the rest of the world. God wanted to put a spotlight on the people of Israel. First reason was so that the rest of the world would take notice and notice that the Israelites were different. So then they would ask and wonder, and that would give the people opportunity to tell them about a Savior that was coming. The other reason why they did things so different was to point the people to that Savior, to show them all the different ways that God was going to save them, how he was going to save them, so that when the Savior came, there would be no mistaken that he was the one that God had been promising. After he gave those commands that are mostly found in the book of Leviticus, the people then were to set out. The people were now ready to go into the promised land. But, the, but when they were about to enter, they decided they were going to send some spies into the land. They wanted to scout it out, wanted to give the people a report. Who are they going to face first? What does it look like? What can they expect? This was a good plan. It's good to be prepared. And so 12 men, one from each tribe, went in and explored the land. The only problem was that when they came back, 10 of those men were convinced that there was no way that they could save or be saved or win any battle with these people. These nations were bigger. They were stronger. They had walled cities. There was no way in their eyes that they could win, except two men believed that God could save them. These two men remembered that God rescued them from the bigger power, the Egyptians, who had even more weapons and better artillery. God had no problem with them. And so, of course, God is not going to have any problems with these nations. The people had no reason to doubt God, and yet they still did. They doubted him. And as a result, God decided that everyone 20 years old and older was never going to see the promised land. They were going to wander the desert until that whole generation had perished, except the two men who trusted in God. Forty years later is where our lesson picks up. The next generation is now ready to enter the promised land. But once again, God puts their trust in him to the test. The people are see that the direct route is through the country of Edom, and that's the descendants of Esau. So these are some relatives, distant relatives of the Israelites. And so they asked, can we go through your land so that we can get to the land we're trying to get to? But the people of Edom said, no, we will not let you through. God didn't want them to fight against their brothers, so he decided to have the people go the long way around. But the people didn't like that. They thought this was another example of God not taking care of them. That it was his fault. They blamed him for all the problems that they had because God wasn't doing enough. Now throughout the lives of the Israelites, them complaining to God was a common occurrence, but this one was different. This time they went even deeper and harder at God. They started proclaiming as if that God wasn't doing anything correct. In fact, they were even looking at the blessings that he did give to them as being the worst thing possible. In fact, they even called the bread that God had provided, the manna, they called it garbage. 
Nothing was good enough for these people. They didn't appreciate all that God was doing for them, and really, he was doing a lot. I mean, imagine, 40 years they were wandering the desert, and their clothes never wore out. Their sandals never gave way. They never were too tired to move. And most importantly, they were never in danger. The desert's a dangerous place, and the people were safe all those years. The people just didn't trust in God, even though they had no reason to doubt Him. In order to show them just how much He helps them so that they could realize that they could trust Him all the time, He took away some of His protection, and He sent those venomous snakes. What do you think would happen if God took away all the things that he does for us? I mean, he's our creator. He's the one who made us exactly who we are. He gave us our abilities so that we can be good at the very things that we are good at, that we're able to make a living in. He's given us our friends and family, those people in our lives that we care about the most. He's given us all our possessions. He's given us everything. What would happen if God took all of those away? What would happen if God no longer kept you healthy or protected you from the evil that's out in the world? There's a lot that could go wrong. What happens if God said, let everything hit us all at the same time? Do you think you would survive? You wouldn't. And even if you thought you could go at least a little bit, you wouldn't last very long. Not without God. Often we are much like the people of Israel, aren't we? We just don't appreciate our God. We don't appreciate all that He does for us. And then when we look at the things that God has given to us, sometimes we act as if it's not enough because we always want more. When we look at the people of Israel, we learn some lessons about how really to treat God and how, what kind of perspective about God we should have. We need to see him as the one who gives us all good things. We need to see him as the one who really is responsible for everything that we have that we find as a blessing. And even in the bad moments of life, he's, it isn't as if God isn't taking care of us. In fact, he's using these events for our good. And even as bad as they might seem, they're not nearly as bad as they could be. God does so much for us. And yet often we are like the people of Israel. We don't learn the lesson that we should trust in God and never complain about anything he gives us. God taught the people a lesson by taking away some of his protection. He took away his protection from the venomous snakes, the deserts full of them, and for 40 years they never entered into the camp until that day. We might say, well, it serves them right, but again, it would serve us right too, wouldn't it? It would serve us right if God treated us the way he treated the people of Israel, because often we don't listen to the lesson that God is trying to teach us. And yet, God doesn't treat us that way, does He? He disciplines us like He does the people of Israel, but again, He doesn't take away all His protection. He doesn't take away all His love. And He shows that even with the people of Israel. As they were being bitten by snakes, they were suffering, yes. But then God shows how much he loves them anyway. They were receiving what they deserved, and yet God still provided a way out. He showed them grace and mercy and love. And he does the same thing for us. He also gives us outs. He also helps us. He also sustains us when we're being tempted. God is there to give us a way out. When we are suffering, God is the one lifting us up so that we don't suffer nearly as much as we could, or maybe we should. 
Even when we're not receiving all the blessings we want, He showers us with so many blessings that we can say He gives us our daily bread and that we are just fine. In fact, we can always say that we are blessed and we can always be thankful. Our God does all of that for us. But He does even so much more, doesn't He? See, we're busy right now talking about all the earthly blessings that God has given to us, but that doesn't even come close to all the spiritual blessings we have as well. And God demonstrated that kind of love for the world in this lesson today. God showed how much He wants to save the world by not annihilating the people of Israel. Maybe the people of Israel had it coming, but God made a promise. He promised that He was going to save the world through a Savior that was going to come from their family line. And by keeping them alive, by protecting them, by having Moses raise that bronze snake and reminding the people that you can trust God all the time, he was demonstrating a love unlike any other. A love not just for the people of Israel, but a love for you and for me. Because if the people of Israel would have been annihilated, the promise of a Savior would have gone with them. God was going to keep his promise. He was going to save not just them, but us as well. The question today, though, is why did he do it? Why did he save the people? Why did, why did he ultimately save you and me when Jesus came down to die on the cross? And we see our answer. It's love. That's it. That's the reason why. We may not be able to understand the love of our God, but that's why He came. That's why He saved us. He loves us so much. He loves you so much that He rescued these people who often complained and, bicker and, and were bitter towards Him. God loved you so much that He kept that promise for years and years and years all the way up till Jesus came. Years of the people of Israel acting just like this to him. And yet he kept that promise alive so that he could save you. God loves you so much that he's even willing to forgive your bitterness, your sins, the times when you have proven you do not deserve his love. And we prove that every day, don't we? How often we are bitter towards God. How often we don't appreciate all that He does for us. How often we think He's not doing enough, even calling what He gives us garbage. But that's not the case, is it? And God proves that by showing His love, by going to a cross and dying for us. The Apostle Paul is right. It is by grace. But that's the only way it can be explained. We didn't deserve it. We've never earned it. And yet we have it. And as Jesus told, told us in John, it's just simply because of love. Love for a people who do not deserve His love, but a love that He gives anyway. A love to you and to me. A love that He expresses when he says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life, because God did not send his Son into the world to condemn us, but to save us through him and his work alone. We never need to doubt our God. There's never a reason we need to complain. We can always look to Him and be grateful and know that we are blessed even if we're suffering, even if we're not receiving everything we, we might want. We have more than enough and we have what's most important. We have our God and we have His love and grace and mercy that He showers on us always. And we know that it's ours because Jesus said it, God so loved the world, no one's excluded, not you, not me, not anyone. We are the world, 
and therefore we have God's love. Amen. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding may it keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us now confess our mutual faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time, if you're interested in giving a thank offering to our ministry, you can do so by going to our website and seeing the, the many different ways you can give to our congregation. We certainly thank you for your generosity. If you are a guest, please don't feel obligated to give. We are simply honored that we are able to share God's word with you today. Now let us bow our heads in prayer and say in the prayer of the church, followed by the Lord's Prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, oh, how we're like the people of Israel. Often we neglect all that you give us. How often we forget all that you give us. How often we take you for granted. Lord, too often we complain to you as if you don't take care of us at all. But Lord, you do. Please forgive us of the times that we do complain. Forgive us for all our sins. For Forgive us for the sake of Jesus Christ, who went to the cross to die for us all. Thank you for showing your love to us, that we can always know for certain that we are saved and going to be with you in heaven. We know this because Jesus came for the whole world, and he died for the whole world, and he went to a cross for the whole world, which means he did all of that for me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for doing everything for me so that I can always rest assured and be confident that I am your child and that I am taken care of. Thank you for all of these wonderful blessings. In Jesus' name we pray, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And receive with believing hearts the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Once again, thank you for worshiping with us. Please worship with us again. And may the Lord bless your week.